Hi everybody, my name is David Trail. I teach at Suncoast Community High School in Riviera Beach, Florida. The topic of my presentation today is coming home, getting back to normalcy, and looking back. The intent is to look at what veterans experienced as they came home, uh, whether the reality of coming home matched quite what they built up in their minds. Then they sort of got to work um, having a life and raising families and building up an economy. And then a lot of years passed by and then we ended up suddenly realizing what national treasures walked amongst us. And we basically started finding ways to honor them and make sure we recorded their stories before it was too late. Just some numbers to get us uh, get us ready for things. Approximately 16 million Americans, men and women, served in uniform during World War II. The average amount of time that somebody spent in the service was 33 months. Out of those 16 million, 73% of those veterans served overseas in various capacities. And for those deployed overseas, they spent an average of 16 months outside the United States. But one thing that was absolutely in common for every serviceman and woman, no matter where they were, were memories of home, where they left. Um, you know, if they were in the United States even, and they weren't deployed anywhere near where their family was, thoughts of home still pervaded what they went through daily. For those that were overseas, it represented obviously quite a lot more. So to give an example, um, we have a Navy electrician's mate, third class, Robert Matthias, writing his family from Guadalcanal in September of 1945. Now in this particular case, it's basically right after the peace treaty's been signed and he writes, I sure would like to be able to tell you that I could be home for that Christmas dinner and that lemon pie you spoke of. We do have good eats here, but nothing like you can fix food at home and oh, how much I would give for a few quarts of good cold raw milk. It would take several quarts for the first fill. I could also stand some of those delicious hamburgers that you make. I guess I had better change the subject as I am licking my chops now. I don't know how I would feel when I'm, once again I can wear an iron shirt. I'm so anxious to get back home again and into a good bed with a good mattress on it. When I get home again, you'll never get me out of that house for I'm going to really be a houseplant and stay at home. Honey, I'll even dry dishes for you. I expect that, and this is obviously going to his kids at this point, uh, I expect you've forgotten daddy, but daddy sure hasn't forgotten that he has a little girl at home that was just a baby when he went away. Well, darlings, I am just rambling on and not saying much, but I can always say this. I am looking forward and living for the day when I can be back home with my darling three. I think each day that it is one day nearer to the time when I can be with you again. So in writing these letters back and forth, they built up this idyllic sense of what home was, and then they had to come home. For the most part, people didn't get home during the war. And when they did get home during the war, it was usually because, for instance, if you were on a ship, such as my good friend Dick Ramsey, who was on the battleship Nevada, they did convoy duty across the Atlantic and occasionally they'd put into a port in the United States and for a few days, they would be back on American soil. If you were a serviceman like an army soldier, typically you didn't make it home, unless of course, uh, you were severely wounded and you needed some medical care, or perhaps you were brought back to the States to provide uh, some additional training to other people junior to yourself. Um, but for the most part, you know, you stayed overseas until the war was over. And home was, of course, something that mattered an awful lot to them. When people did get home, when the war came to an end, um, there were obviously some parades right at the outset. For instance, Dwight Eisenhower got recognized in New York City with a ticker tape parade that was really, really excited to see the general in charge of everything going on in Europe. And he got his parade. Um, there were signs that could be hung all over the place in various communities. But such as my friend Dick Ramsey, when he came home, it was months after the war was over and all the parades were over and nobody was out there cheering when he came home. I mean, his parents were glad to see him, don't get me wrong. But overall, as soon as people came home, they pretty much put everything behind them and they went into what would be considered you know, a normal life. They tried to resume that as much as possible. An example of that uh, would be a woman like Camille Mikulowski, who in 2015 was interviewed, and uh, she's from Brockton, Massachusetts, and she received a Bronze Star for meritorious service before returning home at the end of World War II. But she didn't tell anybody about it for more than 25 years. And that's when a reporter from the Patriot Ledger asked her in the 1970s about some commendations that she had earned during the year and a half of the Pacific that she had served as a staff sergeant in the Women's Army Corps. Mikulowski, or Mikey as she was often known by her fellow wax, she spent time in the jungles of New Guinea and on Leyte in the Philippines. She encrypted ships, ships' schedules into secret code. But when she came home, she didn't talk about her experiences, not to her parents or her seven siblings. She simply put her medal away in a drawer and went on with her life. 
She later recalled, I was embarrassed to tell anybody I had it. And this is what she's talking about at the age of 88. Um, she moved to Brockton after war. She said, you didn't go around bragging and I felt that I didn't do that much. A lot of veterans of World War II are very humble and they, again, pretty much all say, I felt like I didn't do that much or I'm not a hero or all these other things. They just went on with their lives and it was, it was a challenge at times. Some people had it harder. Some people just couldn't go back to normal life. My friend Dick Ramsey could. He went back to his job at the New York Naval Shipyard and went right back to what he'd been doing when he was called up into the Navy. But there are other people like Otis Mackey who lived in East Texas. And in a newspaper article that he was interviewed for, he said, when we got out, you couldn't talk about things like that. You held it all in. I didn't want to take it to my family. If you'd say anything, people wouldn't believe half of what you say anyway. He was rocking furiously, faster and faster, speaking of his first day in combat, when his best friend was shot through the neck and killed, and the day that he watched fellow soldiers dismembered by landmines. The leg with the combat boot and all, I had to duck, he told a reporter. I had seen it coming at me. I just ducked, and McGee's leg went flying right by my head. That has been one of my guilty points because I was right there ready to step on that mine. I never could figure out why it was him and not me. Mackey drank heavily when he returned to Texas and worked three jobs as a machinist so he was too tired to remember his dreams at night. I don't know why my wife even stayed with me, he said. The memories of what people went through obviously were something they carried with them for the rest of their lives. One friend of mine who's a World War II veteran said that he's had, he had no problems adjusting after the war, no negative memories, and he completed 37 missions over Europe in a B-17 hanging underneath in a ball turret. Um, he came back, married his sweetheart back home within weeks of being home, and he went on with his life. Let's just mention for a moment long-term memories. Um, another newspaper article that I found for this particular piece said, I'm a speech language pathologist. Recently, I was asked to help an 84 year old nursing home gentleman to create a memory book so that he could become oriented to the year, month and place he's living. In his medical chart, it stated active combat World War II for three years as a Marine. He is conversant, but forgetful of short term memory. Long term memory is intact and I have been privileged to hear some of his stories. I have thanked him repeatedly for his service to us. Tears come to his eyes when I speak of it. Some memories, even Alzheimer's, can't erase. The difficult memories were things that caused people to start to seek some help after the war. There were approximately 100,000 people who started going to the Veterans Administration for some sort of what we would call PTSD help today. Um, and an awful lot of people suppress those memories, like Otis Mackey doing it through, uh, through drinking. There are accounts of far too many kids, boomers, who basically had parents who, because they were haunted by what they had seen, were distant, had difficulties in some cases, forming strong relationships with their own children, simply because they had gotten close to people before and had some difficulties when they were lost. So these veterans came back and essentially tried to put as much as they could behind them. They didn't talk about things much. It was just something that never happened. Violet Kokendorfer, worked for the American Red Cross during World War II. And she writes, finally, I was back in my hometown. I'd called so many places home in those three and a half years that after the initial excitement of seeing family and friends and being a center of attention for a short time, coming back to Minnesota was a letdown. Even though I was asked to speak at the local Red Cross, the Rotary Club and Teachers College, I kept remembering the letter Mary had written me when I was still in Garmish. Vi, you'll be amazed when you get home how little you have in common with people. I'm just now beginning to get my feet planted on the ground. And dates with fellows who weren't even in the army are perfectly ghastly. And Elsie had written, I found it difficult to adjust to a civilian way of life. My girlfriends are all married and raising families and after the initial ohs and ahs, we haven't much in common anymore. I've admired more children than a governor running for election. And simply put, Major Richard Winters, best known as Dick Winters of Band of Brothers fame, said simply, it's hard to talk to someone who wasn't there. It's not just the memories. They don't know what questions to ask. So where could they go to potentially get some sort of camaraderie, to, to have some outlet to talk about things? There were places. For example, there were places like the VFW, the Veterans for Foreign Wars or the American Legion. And obviously they had quite a lot of new members coming home from World War II. Of course, they'd had a lot of members from World War I and a lot of them were still around. 
And it also gave the people who were involved in the VFW and the American Legion a chance to give back to communities, to be involved with something, to to be amongst uh, people who had similar experiences to their own. Uh, they sponsored local civic activities such as uh, patriotic essay contests. Uh, if you watch videos from the 1950s, the American Legion's having national meetings where people are are competing in essentially what we would look like. You know, it's a almost like a marching band, but it's a drill team at the same time, uh, calling back to some of their military type memories. Membership of the American Legion went up really, really quickly after the war. It went up by 600,000 in 1945 alone. In 1946, they reached their all-time high of 3.3 million. But joining these civic organizations wasn't for every single veteran. Dick Ramsey, for example, uh, didn't find it easy to go to the American Legion of Veterans of Foreign Wars because, as he put it, he was just too busy. He was out there working seven days a week and started having children. Got, of course, he'd gotten married. Um, and he was busy essentially leading his post-war life. So while those outlets were there for some, others just simply you know, pressed ahead and soldiered on. Now, the GI Bill was, was one of the things that the government did, and it was probably one of the most forward-thinking things that the U.S. government ever did as regards uh, thinking ahead and planning for veterans' needs. This was conceived of in 1943, uh, and obviously, if you think about it for a moment, if you had 16 million individuals suddenly come home and all looking for jobs, you would see unemployment spike. And that wasn't something the American economy was ready for. Obviously, the economy was doing very well during the war years, but to suddenly have 16 million eligible individuals come back and looking for jobs as different factories retooled for peacetime needs and other things, it was going to be a tremendous challenge and it could set back the American economy greatly. So the GI Bill was written up and it was passed partially through the efforts of the American Legion and the VFW. Um, it was sponsored by Edith Norse Rogers, um, who was standing behind the president when it got signed, Congresswoman from Massachusetts. And in this particular case, the official title of it was the Serviceman's Readjustment Act of 1944. It was signed by FDR on June 22nd of 1944, and it did a number of things that dramatically improved lives of the veterans coming home. For example, um, and probably the best known thing, it offered college or technical training to former service members, including tuition, books, supplies, and counseling services at no cost. It also offered assistance for different service members who wanted to buy homes, much like we have VA loans today. Uh, the government essentially guaranteed the loans of these former service people. You had to apply at your local bank, um, and more often than not, you know, things went right through when you made your application because the government basically told the banks, hey, as long as you get the paperwork and process it, you know, we guarantee that we'll stand behind the veteran and make it possible for them to buy a home. And in quite a lot of places, veterans started buying homes. Um, think about it for a moment when the when the veterans started coming home, um, there wasn't there wasn't anything like a suburb system throughout the United States. Those came after the war. And, you know, if you came from a place like New York City, you would uh, maybe come back and, and, you know, maybe you get married to that girl you've been writing to all that time. And you might be forced to move in with your mom and dad. And it's not anything that newlyweds are going to want. They're going to want a place of their own. But there's only so much space in a city, even as they're building skyscrapers that continue to go higher and higher and higher. So you start looking for places like suburbs, places outside of town. And these veterans began coming home and looking for places of their own, places like Levittown, for example, um, which was one of these pioneering suburbs. Now, the GI Bill, as far as its, uh, its educational side, was a, an absolute success. The GI Bill educationally um, got an awful lot of people who might have never been able to go to college before. Suddenly, it made it a reality and a possibility. Um, in one particular article I read for getting ready for this, um, the typical person who went to college from this one small town that I was reading about was like the teacher's kid or the banker's kid, but that was it. Everybody else was going to go work in some factory somewhere and not know what they were going to be doing. But the GI Bill made these individuals overseas when they heard about it say, you know what, I want to do something with my life. And they came back. And according to the different studies that I've read, these veterans were very, very serious about their studies. Academically, they did very well. Um, and they took advantage of these opportunities. They never thought they would get college then was not like college today, where my seniors I teach are pretty much all expecting to go to college. Back in the day, um, that just didn't happen. It wasn't the norm. It wasn't the expectation. 
So in one of the examples of an individual taking advantage of the GI Bill benefits, a uh, very dear friend of mine, Bob Erskine, um, he was from the Syracuse area and he really wanted to go to Syracuse. And when he came back from the war, having been a medic at the Battle of the Bulge and elsewhere, um, you know, he called up Syracuse and he heard about the GI Bill and he basically said, hey, what are my chances? And they said, well, we're all full up right now. I mean, colleges were full. They had to use, in some cases, Quonset huts for, for housing for people because there were so many people coming to college. They just simply didn't have the room for them yet. And they told Bob, well, why don't you come down and just see if maybe something happens on a Friday? So they got down there on the Friday, and sure enough, they found a spot that he could go to college in Syracuse. He's at orientation the next week, and Bob, like many servicemen, had grand ambitions of dating every girl on campus they could possibly find when they came back from the war. Freshman orientation, he looked across the room and there was Janie. And as he puts it, I was done. And he he and Janie started dating and they got married soon thereafter. And both of them are still around today and are just absolutely the most, you know, beautiful old couple you'd possibly want to see. But you know, again, without the GI Bill, he would have never met Jane. They would have never had their three kids. He never would have been my veteran, perhaps on the honor flight. And it's all because of the GI Bill. The Department of Defense has some numbers about um, what the GI Bill did. In the first seven years that the GI Bill was, was around, eight million service members used the program's benefits to go to some sort of college or technical training. By 1947, half of all the college students and 70% of all the male students in colleges were enrolled via the GI Bill. One third of those using the bill did so in college while the other, well, about another half uh, went through some sort of vocational or trade program. And for instance, those would be people getting trained in plumbing or carpentry or other vitally needed skills, air conditioning for people like me who live in Florida, which was a, a new thing at the time. And it also led to an explosion in the number, not only of just college graduates, but people with advanced degrees as well. The Department of Defense's numbers um, had some interesting statistics. For example, 14 Nobel Prize winners got to college because of the GI Bill, as did 24 recipients of the Pulitzer Prize, some 450,000 engineers, 240,000 accountants, 238,000 teachers, 91,000 scientists, 67,000 doctors, and 22,000 dentists, amongst others. And obviously, you know, those teachers, they taught people like my parents um, and, and, you know, got them steered right so that hopefully I would turn out okay, and we're still debating that. But um, overall, you know, this did a tremendous thing to help the United States move forward with research into things like plastics or nuclear engineering or other things that were just pioneering industries at the time or just theoretical things that now were realities because people had backgrounds in these issues. As far as the home buying side of things, by 1955, some 4.3 million home loans worth some $33 billion had essentially gone out under the auspices of the GI Bill's home buying program. Um, unfortunately, this is you know where you start to see some, some challenges with the success of things. Sure, they were making lots of loans to a lot of people, uh, but as mentioned before, Levittown, they specifically refused to sell any of these homes that they were offering to anyone who was black. Um, they basically froze them out from being able to, to take advantage of things. In the summer of 1947, 3,000 veterans got home loans in the state of Mississippi. Despite the fact that the population is 50% black, out of those 3,000 veterans, only two of the applications that were approved were for black veterans. And there were also some issues. There were obviously in the, in the South, most of the colleges um, that existed were not willing to take blacks. And as a result, um, they were limited in the places they could go also to potentially get a university education. And it would lead to things like James Meredith and others um, essentially trying to take advantage of those benefits later on. Now, over the years, you know, the veterans, of course, are making their way through society and they're, they're raising families and they're, they're having their careers and they're, um, you know, building up America. But did they have a way to sort of let out what they'd talked or what they'd been through? Did they have an opportunity and an outlet to um, meet others like themselves? Well, there were reunions at times whether it was for a ship or if it was for, let's say, for instance, a bomb group or, or different associations in general, they did happen. 
But for the most part, veterans largely suppressed what they'd gone through. There are so many accounts of people who, who had veterans as, as parents who said that my dad never talked about it. My grandpa never talked about it. Um, he might tell me a funny story, but he never told anybody, including my mom. Um, and the only time I ever heard something was when he was over talking with one of his buddies, but that was about it. So what broke that log jam? In 1998, the groundbreaking uh, Steven Spielberg film, Saving Private Ryan came out. And obviously for anybody who's seen it, you know, you can recognize that the first half hour is a very realistic portrayal of what happened at Normandy in June of 1944. Spielberg's father was a veteran himself and Spielberg wanted to honor his father by doing as good a job as possible. And there are quite a lot of veterans who went to go see the film. And in some cases they knew what they were going to see and in some cases they didn't. And a lot of veterans when they went to it began to relive their experiences mentally. Some of them left the theater. Um, you know, because they couldn't handle the emotions that came flooding back to them. Um, and then they went home and they had to deal with, you know, the images they'd seen that they tried to suppress for so many years. Uh, San Francisco area veteran Roy Gass, for example, had gone to see Saving Private Ryan. And then he told the newspaper, last night was really bad. I must have gotten up a dozen times. But something happened when Saving Private Ryan came out. Suddenly the public began to look at these, these old men and these older women and see them as individuals who weren't just the old people in the car driving down the street or in their grocery store. They began to see them as individuals who confronted something that was significant. And we realized the opportunity to ask them about their stories and their experiences were something that even at that time were disappearing daily. And some of the veterans began opening up and talking about their experiences. If a grandfather went with a grandson, for example, the grandson might see the grandfather in a whole new light and ask the grandfather, was it like what you experienced? And maybe the grandfather was a CB in the Pacific and it didn't look anything like what Normandy looked like. The grandfather could then have some sort of context to talk to the grandson about what was going on. So Saving Private Ryan was also roughly about the time that we also saw Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, come out. And suddenly you had a book that talked about an awful lot of different veterans' experiences and holding them up, and again, broke on his case. His dad was a World War II veteran. Um, you had Ryan coming out, you had Greatest Generation coming out, and this groundswell began to appear of, we should really talk to people about what their experiences were in the war. So one of the things that came out of that, and something that my students have used, and I'm sure other teachers in the conference who are presenting have used before, um, people across the country over the years, have availed themselves of what's known as the Veterans History Project run by the Library of Congress. And the Veterans History Project um, is actually this really amazing uh, repository where um, they have accounts of individuals from World War I, including all the way to the present day with Afghanistan and Iraq, um, where individuals who are involved in various conflicts um, have been interviewed and their stories are, are permanently preserved in the Library of Congress. Uh, some of the stories are, are streamable online uh, with video or with original documents that have been scanned in, for example. They have literally, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of submissions um, from different individuals, men and women. And in some cases, people like Rosie the Riveters, um, they're also encouraged to tell their stories about how the war impacted their lives beyond, you know, like my dad was in the service and I you know, was at home while he went to war. That doesn't apply. But the Veterans History Project, there are people there have been interviewed by congressmen's offices and by school children and everything else. And it's really an amazing place where we now have this, this record, this archive of people who took part in World War II and we can hear their experiences. So there's another example, you know, kid saw Saving Private Ryan, you know, and, and he said, you know, I want to go talk to some veterans. His teacher basically said, we're going to make this a, a thing that's going to happen. It's been an ongoing project. Um, and it's happened in places all across the country. Now, another thing that's also been very, very um, cathartic for veterans and getting them to talk about their experiences and again, to finally appreciate the magnitude of what they what, what it was that they did during World War II. Um, our honor flights, which is something that the World War II Memorial has been integral in. Um, the honor flight program, uh, which hopefully this year will be resuming uh, this fall, having taken a year off for COVID. Um, the honor flight program has taken over two, or about 200,000 World War II veterans since the program began, primarily to Washington, D.C., 
where they get a day to see the memorial that many of them have it was built after many of them were already a little bit old and not really wanting to travel all that much so now the honor flight program takes these individuals and assigns them a guardian which i have done nine times myself um, and you've got somebody who's younger assisting this this older veteran and um, they're brought up to washington they're taken to various sites it could be um, to the changing of the guard at the at Arlington National Cemetery or or to other places, but you know one of the highlights is going to a place like the World War II Memorial, which most of them have never seen before, and they get an opportunity to see what has been left for generations, where it's inscribed different campaigns in the Asian theater or in the Pacific theater or over in Europe, with key phrases by by World War II people such as FDR or or Eisenhower. They see the gold stars that are there and they think about what those gold stars represent. Um, they get to, you know, somewhat comically search for Kilroy hidden on the on the memorial. They get to look at the bronze, you know, little um, reliefs up on the entrance. But the thing that really makes it come home for them is the people who walk up to them and shake their hands gently and give them, you know, very, very, you know, appreciative hugs and say thank you. And they sometimes stop and ask them about their service and things like that. And it is a day that many of them describe as the second best day of their lives. Usually they're going to say the best day of their lives uh, was the day they got married to their spouse. And, you know, sometimes I've asked my veterans, I'm like, wait, second best day? You've had kids. And they're like, yeah, you know, this was better than when my kids were born. Because they've never gotten the parade. They've never gotten the appreciation. They've never gotten the love that they experience all day. And again, the World War II Memorial is like this collection point where it happens uh, on any given weekend in a normal year um, quite a lot of times. And sometimes there are reenactors out there dressed up in uniforms. In the past, Senator Bob Dole has been out there himself, a World War II veteran, greeting these veterans coming home like their brothers. Um, it's a tremendous place and it gives these veterans such an emotional uplift. I had one who had um, had some dementia issues that I brought one year and his wife told me that this, the scrapbook, the album that I, I made for him um, when we got home, he remembered every detail about that day. He would Anybody who visited their apartment, he would grab the book and, and sit, make him sit down and relive what he went through and it opened up stories because long-term memories are a lot easier for people with any kind of, of dementia. And he would be talking about his wartime experiences with family members who had never heard those stories until it became unlocked by going to the memorial and having an opportunity to finally process what it was that he had done. So these veterans came home, um, they raised families, they had kids, they built our economy into the greatest country of all time. They held their private anguish inside them uh, for so many years. And now, finally, they're getting their chance to be appreciated. There's less and less of them around every single day. But that's why, for instance, we do the things we do, like this conference. And, uh, you know, it's, it's worth thinking about the fact that, you know, they were willing to sacrifice everything. They went overseas. All they could think about was home. They came home, buried their emotions. And here they are today, and we owe them an awful debt of gratitude. Uh, and with that, I'm ready for questions.